Well, hello, men, and thanks for joining me. I'm uh, joined today by uh, an author that I, uh, I'm really looking forward to uh, speaking with, uh, Dr. Jay Stringer. Um, not a doctor. Oh, not a doctor! Wow, <laughs> not a doctor. man, I, I'm I'm puffing your bio here. Just a master's degree. <laughs> well, still, he uh, he is a a uh, psychotherapist and uh, counselor and minister, and uh, he just wrote a new book that I'm really excited about um, called Unwanted: How Sexual Brokenness Reveals Our Way to Healing. Uh, and he deals with an issue that's really um, prevalent in our culture, um, in this idea of sexual brokenness or unwanted sexual behavior. Um, and we're going to talk today about his book and about a lot of the research he did that kind of led up to the writing of this book. He did um, some original research that's just really revealing, interviewed 3,800 men and women, and uh, just discovered some real insights on how to deal with um, our sexual brokenness as as creatures that are wounded by sin, and how we can how we can begin to heal. So thanks so much for being with us, Jay. Sam, so so fun to be with you. Thank you for having me on. Uh, I think I'm just going to call you Doctor Jay from here on out. Doctor Jay, you know, an honorary <laughs> doctorate. Okay. Um, well, I I you know it's funny. I uh, ordered a copy of your book, and yep. the dog ate it. Uh, so I Seriously. actually don't have a hard copy. I've got the Kindle version though. So, but yeah, I, ate it. I came home and it was in shreds on my porch. So <laughs> apparently the, the, the UPS guy, uh, didn't think to put it out of their site. So at any rate, <laughs> that's the first time I have heard of unwanted being eaten by yes. an animal. Yes. The dog ate my homework. Um, <laughs> But at any rate, uh, it's a it's an awesome book, really unique, I think, in this in covering this topic, you know, and and we, the big elephant in the room, especially among Christians and among Catholics, kind of is this issue of sexual brokenness or you know sexual sin, whatever you want to call it. Uh, but it's a problem that plagues especially men, and there's such a great deal of shame around this issue. Uh, mm -hmm. a great deal of fear of being opening up and being vulnerable about it. Um, and so it's just, it's just the thing that we all struggle with, but nobody wants to talk about. Um, but you uh, kind of bring a new way of looking at things. And I want to talk about that briefly today. So just, just to kind of get back to the beginning, what inspired you to write this book? Uh, what was the, what was the spark? Yeah, I'm a psychotherapist, not a psychologist, which would make me a doctor. Uh, but essentially, men and women were arriving in my office with almost no understanding of what freedom from sexual brokenness was all about. So as you had just mentioned, uh, there's a lot of shame associated with this subject. And the primary methods and techniques that people were given to combat this uh, was essentially about bouncing your eyes. In some cases, people would have rubber bands around their wrists that they would slap. Uh, whenever they would have a lustful thought. Uh, sometimes they would be encouraged to pursue accountability or to get monitoring on various devices. And yet, as the years continue to roll on for these men and women, they actually provide people pathways into lasting freedom. And so what I realized is that unless we radically disrupt this conversation, we're going to continue to consign men and women into a lifetime of futility with this issue. And I just didn't believe that it needed to be that way. So, uh, you know, if you grew up in the, I would just say like the religious right, whether that's Catholic, Christian, uh, one of the things that I would observe especially with people that grew up in the 80s and the purity movement, was that there was such a kind of pray it away mentality or this approach to, uh, in some youth groups, there would even be this jar in the center of the room that if you masturbated or looked at porn, you would drop $5 in, $10 <laughs> in. And that was supposed to be 
the deterrent to watch porn. Um, and yet as a therapist, uh, I started observing just patterns in my clients' lives uh, that I became really, really curious about. So I thought, why don't we just ask people that are struggling with pornography, struggling with infidelity or buying sex to tell us a little bit about their backstory, to tell us about the things that are driving this to begin with. And to me, this is one of the most faithful approaches to scripture and to the human heart that we could ever engage is this notion that God is curious about who we are and the decisions that we make. So when you think about kind of just the Old Testament, when God approaches Adam after he's just eaten the fruit, God doesn't say, Adam, stop hiding. Don't do that again. Pray it away the next time. He says, Adam, where are you? And what is it that you have done? And then we see this play out with the life of Hagar, who's just been immensely traumatized by the first family of the faith. The angel of the Lord appears to her and says, Hagar, where do you come from and where are you going? And so to me, so much of the the, the approach that I really want to invite people into is this sense of curiosity, that when God moves towards us in our lives, it's not to get us to stop something, but it's much more to to ask us a question about why is it that this sexual thought, why is it that this particular porn search, why is it that this type of sexual behavior is the thing that's appealing to you year after year after year. So as one of my dear friends recently said, he said, Jay, when I've been having the same conversation with my accountability partner for 15 years, something isn't working. And right. so... Yeah. We, we took all that together to say, let's ask people who are struggling, pornography users, people that are fantasizing and pursuing affairs, to tell us their story. Uh, and what I can tell you, uh, just real briefly with the data, is that our unwanted sexual behaviors are not random at all. They are a direct reflection of the parts of our story that remained unaddressed. And so the implication is, if we want freedom, we have to identify the unique reasons that bring us to it in the first place. Yeah, wow. So, you, I mean, this you interviewed a lot of people for this. Uh, <laughs> I did. Uh, 3,800, right? So, uh, yep. that's a pretty good sample size. It's a great sample size, yep. What did you discover? What did you find the common threads that a lot of these stories uh, shared. Yeah. So one of the first things that, if I could put it like this, our, our story shapes the sexual choices that we make. So um, one way of thinking about this is uh, a cut, over the summer, I was trying to ride my bike to downtown Seattle every single day. Uh, during the summer. And so from about May until August, I had done it. And probably one of the last weeks of August, I was uh, downtown Seattle at a red light on my bike and uh, the light turned green. And I don't know if you've ever had those moments as an adult where you fell off a bike, but I went to push the pedal forward uh, and the chain didn't move. And all 62 centimeters of my bike fell over and I landed <laughs> right on my uh, left hand. And so my left leg was also gashed up. And so that's what got all the kind of immediate attention as I did a lot of wound care to my left leg. But here we are many months later and I can't even do a push up. Uh, because of my left hand. And so it, I, I'm not quite certain because I haven't been to, uh, <laughs> to, to get an x-ray yet, but I'm pretty sure my left hand uh, has a minor fracture to it. And so what ends up happening is that brokenness, uh, I'm, I'm contorting it. It's getting probably more and more injured with time. And so I can either treat this with a good pint of beer, a gin and tonic, painkillers, uh, or I can kind of go back to the original wounds uh, and begin to really address it. And so one of the things that we found, uh, especially with pornography users, is that the most significant pornography users had sexual abuse scores that were nearly 24% higher than those that did not view pornography at all. And so one of the ways of thinking about this is that when we hear the phrase sexual abuse, many of us immediately dismiss it because we think about someone in a white van that's creepy and then abducts a kid. But the reality is if you were introduced to pornography uh, by someone older than you um, that said, hey, Sam or Jay, come and see this. 
uh, or you know your parents had it in there underneath their bed, uh, you're not discovering pornography. You're being introduced to it. Um, and so I would say that there's a spectrum of the way that abuse impacts our lives, that it's often done with someone really close to us. Uh, and so in this experience, we're, we're feeling arousal and pleasure, but then we're also feeling cortisol of what if I get caught with pornography or what if like what's happening to me is discovered. And so what initially happens is there's this sexual cocktail that's formed of secrecy, pleasure, cortisol, um, that then later in life, you actually don't feel alive sexually unless you're reenacting and remixing some of those original trauma templates that you've experienced. And so, uh, again, whether that's the family system that you grew up in, some themes of sexual abuse, the sexual brokenness that we're, feel that we're experiencing actually provides clues into our life story if we're willing to listen to it. Yes, yes. So, so you talked about um, all these unhelpful ways that that Christians often deal with unwanted sexual behavior, or, or just the, this idea of sexual sin. Like, like you, you ask almost any Christian out there, like, is it okay to look at pornography? Like, is that does, is God pleased with that? And by and large, mm -hmm. most Christians would say no, it's a sin. Um, you know, and, and, yeah. and Catholics for sure, you know, we go to confession for this kind of stuff all the time. Like, you talk to any priest, they're like, 99% of what I hear is like sexual <laughs> stuff. So, okay. you know, why doesn't that, why doesn't that stuff work? You know, why is it just willing it or, you know, just screwing up your courage, uh, and just facing it head on? Like, why doesn't that work? Uh, or why doesn't the kind of the more shame-based techniques like like you were describing the jar in the center of the youth group that makes the youth pastor very rich by the way mm -hmm. um, you know, why doesn't <laughs> exactly. that why does that stuff work exactly. uh, for so many reasons it doesn't work uh, the one of the main ones is that uh, we have we use antiquated language so often in Christian circles around how to talk about this. So if you ask most men, if you're struggling with porn, they'll say, I'm lonely. I just struggle with lust. Um, and so if those are the two language systems that you have to address it, you're going to miss the other drivers that actually bring you to pornography. So uh, as a therapist, one of the primary examples that I would say with married men and single men is that they will come in and talk to me about like, let's say this married man comes in with a bid for connection to his wife uh, and his wife declines sex the night before and he's pretty upset about it. And so she turns over, goes to bed and he doesn't know how to regulate his disappointment, his anger, his feeling of rejection. And then about an hour later, he's on Tumblr, Instagram, some porn site going through his normal ritual of pornography and sexual brokenness. So if we only have language to say, you're just a lonely man, but we don't actually have language to say, no, there's actually an anger and an entitlement within your sexuality, we're never going to be able to transform that dimension of our life because we have no language to name that it exists. And so again, if you're just trying to say, I struggle with lust and stop doing it, you're, you've never had to engage your anger or your entitlement as a man. Uh, the other issue is that uh, one of the fascinating things about the research is that uh, the specific pornography searches that we make actually provide clues to us about the type of life that we've experienced. So one of the main uh, pornography searches in my research had to do with men that wanted to see a teenager uh, a college student, a woman that suggested to them some level of subservience or a petite body type. And so one of the things that we looked at in the analytics is that if that was your fantasy uh, and that was what you searched for in pornography, what did that actually say about you? And what we found were that there were three primary associations to that fantasy. One was having a very strict father. Uh, two was high levels of a lack of purpose in your life. Huh. And the third was high levels of shame. And so to me as a minister and as a therapist, the writing on the wall is that one of the reasons why pornography becomes so appealing to us as men is that it gives us this arena to reestablish dominance in the midst of a life where we've been really powered over 
by a dogmatic authoritarian father, but also dealing with a lot of just life futility in our life. And that's one of the reasons why pornography is so seductive is because you can get exactly what you want without any level of failure um, and any level of relational requirement. And, you know, like when you get home from work, uh, there, there's going to be demands on your life to pay bills, to hang out with your family, to be able to cook dinner clean. And that's the seduction to pornography is basically give me all of your problems and I'm going to create a world of five minutes, 30 minutes, an hour where all of that just basically fades away. Right. Um, and so one of my favorite quotes from a Franciscan priest by the name of Father Richard Rohr, it, he says, the pain that we do not transform, we transmit. Always someone else has to suffer because I don't know how to. That's what it comes down to. And so I think one of the things that's happening uh, that reflects back to us about our pornography use is that if we haven't addressed the wounds of our life and some of the difficulties that we're facing in the present, we are going to begin to pursue the subordination of other people and wanting to see women in pornography be subordinate and to serve us because we haven't actually addressed a lot of our own pain and loneliness that's driving it to begin with. Yeah, it's really powerful, that, that idea of the pain that you don't transform, you transmit. And I've seen that you know, over and over again in different contexts where unaddressed issues absolutely end up hurting other people. It's not just about you. Mm -hmm. It's not just about you know, your, your ability to cope. It's, it really does affect other people. And I think, you know, you keep touching on this idea of our story, our story, our story, you know, yes. so often we, you know, our, our left brain, Western mind focus on facts and we, we just want to stuff feelings and we just want to stuff our, our past and, our, mm. you know, I'm just going to tough it up, you know, tough it out. Um, mm -hmm. you know, kind of this stoic, um, sense of, of, uh, whatever happened in the past is in the past. All that matters is, you know, what I do now. And there's truth to that. You know, what you do now does matter, but we want to ignore our past, you know, and nobody wants to, to yes. deal with that, but it gives, it's a painful thing. I mean, who wants to dive into all the, the traumas and, <laughs> and, and wounds that we experienced as children and things like that? But, you know, it sounds like to me that, you know, and, and, and a lot of other research confirms this, but the research that you did especially shows that those, that child that was there, you know, 20, 30, 40 years ago is still very mm -hmm. much with us in some ways. Yes. And, and it affects what we are doing now. It is very much yes. a causal relationship, wouldn't you say? Yes. So, I mean, I think one way that we have to look at it is <clears throat> I would say that pornography exists uh, basically due to, this is way oversimplified, but let's call it lust and anger. So if you think about two rivers coming together, um, the confluence of lust and anger is actually where pornography begins to play out. So what you have playing out in pornography is I, I feel lust, I feel sexual arousal, I feel sexual fantasy, but there's also something about my life in the backdrop that I feel lonely, I feel sorrowful, I feel like my life isn't working out the way that I want it to, and it's really in that confluence that we begin to lean on pornography. But what that echoes back to us is really our story about how we learned how to regulate and how to metabolize the disappointments in our life. And so, you know, if you grew up in a family system that was largely disengaged from you relationally, meaning they didn't ask you questions, they didn't care for you, they didn't observe you in the midst of being bullied or being rejected, one of the things that happens is that pornography becomes really appealing to us that have grown up in that type of family because it gives us some sense of pleasure even some sense of connection with a device or a person or a gaze of someone. Yeah. And so it, what happens to us at a really vulnerable time in life, like 12, 9, 15, whenever we first began to lean on pornography is that that was the beginning of those seeds of lust. But then also a lot of us grew up in families that were very authoritarian, very rigid. Um, and so if we made a bad grade, if we did something wrong, we would be shamed for it. Um, or we grew up in family systems that were like 
very much surveillance culture that everything that we did was monitored. And so one of the things that pornography does is gives us an escape from the midst of being completely ransacked and um, just having someone very hyper vigilantly aware of us. And so if you grow up in that type of rigid family system, you actually feel a lot of anger because you see the hypocrisy of your dad. You know that he presents one way you know, at church or at mass. And then on the other day, you see him screaming his head off at his mom. Right. And the, the, your response to that is that something about this world isn't freaking right. Um, and so what do we do with our lust for connection? What do we do with this sense of anger about what we're witnessing in childhood? And that's where pornography for a lot of us as, as men became a, a regular staple to us. And that allowed us to find lust. And it also gave us a place uh, to play out our anger at others and at women for not being attentive to us or around yeah. us. And I would say much later in life, that pattern is reenacted that I don't know how to deal with my disappointment as a man when I get into a fight with my wife, except for pursuing something that is going to make her pay or something that's going to make me more dysregulated. So that's what I'm trying to invite people into is that I don't think that, I mean, does God want us to refrain from unwanted sexual behavior? Sure. But I think far more God is interested in asking us questions of basically, you know, to the, the question of Cain, why are you so angry? Uh, why is it that this type of pornography search or a woman on her knees is so appealing to you? Why is it that an older woman in pornography or in sexual fantasy becomes something that your heart is seduced by? So I think right. if we can really invite one another to this sense of questioning of, God, don't just help me to stop it, but God, help me to really understand why my heart is so seduced by things that ultimately don't bear beauty and glory. Um, and I, want, I, I really firmly believe that the Spirit of God is so committed to our healing and is not ashamed nor surprised of the sexual brokenness that's in our lives. Yeah, and, and you know, you, you the Scripture calls, you know, Jesus called himself to get, you know, he's a great physician, but... Any good doctor worth mm. anything is going to get to the root of the problem. They're not just going to give you, you know, Tylenol and yes. pat on the head. They, you know, they're not going to just treat the symptoms. They're going to get to mm. the root cause of it. And I think that's exactly what you're trying to say: is that you know, God doesn't want to just put a band aid on our wounds. He wants to truly heal them from the inside out. And I think that's yes, uh, so well said, Sam. It's just a, such a beautiful thing because, um, again, we're so often afraid of that, though, that that, that we would almost rather continue the Band-Aid. And again, in a, in a Catholic context, I'll just go to confession one more time or whatever and, like, and just kind of treat the symptoms. Mm -hmm. um, and and while well, I'm trying, you know, I'm doing this, I'm doing that, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm praying every day and, you know, I'm going to mass and like, I'm, I'm doing all this stuff. So I've done my mm -hmm. part, but we're, we're, we're scared of that. The vulnerability kind of implied in actually that deep healing that you're talking about. Yes. Because, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. They, I mean, so, so well said. I mean, the second section of my book, Unwanted, is basically that question of why do I stay? And so, it, you know, one of the reflections back to us about our sexual brokenness is basically if you did not have this dependable getaway car of pornography, fantasy, uh, every evening or every lunch break, uh, what would you do with that time? And most of what we can't answer if we're bonded to porn or bonded to some type of sexual brokenness is that I don't know who I am. I don't know what to do. So one of the things that uh, we found in the research is that men who lacked purpose in their lives uh, increased their involvement with pornography by a factor of seven. Um, and so, again, if you don't have a sense of who you are, you don't have a sense of who you are you want to become, pornography is going to function in your life like a squatter. And so when I say the word squatter, I mean like uh, just that image of an empty house. I can remember my wife and I moved um, from one rental house in Seattle to another rental house about two miles away. 
And we, I don't know if you've ever been in that scene where you have the U-Haul packed, you're exhausted, my shirt was just drenched. And then we're like, oh, we forgot all the baby stuff down in the basement. So we had like baby <laughs> walkers, strollers. And so I told my wife, I'll just come back in like two or three days uh, and bring it back. And so, you know, two or three days later, I'm back at our old rental house to pick up all the leftover stuff in the basement. And I get this really kind of, my body just starts feeling chills, get this really ominous feeling come over me. And I look up and there's this man that is inside of our house kind of peering between the curtains, basically mouthing expletives at me to tell me to get away. Wow. And so I'm in that split decision of, do I enter this house where there's a squatter living in it, or do I just let that stuff go to goodwill eventually? Um, yeah. And and what I, I just, I drove off. <laughs> I think it was the wise thing to do because I didn't feel like confronting a squatter. But what struck me was that that guy knew within two to three days that there was no one home and that's when he made his entrance and so part of what i would say is happening culturally with loneliness with sorrow with uh the average american watches four and a half hours of television a day is that we don't know who we are we don't know who we want yeah. to become and so all of these squatters show up in our lives and so if we're just going to confession to say sorry did it again uh, I confess my sins. It, I mean, that that's that sense of, that's not just revealing that you're a sinner. That's revealing that you have no idea who you are yeah. and you have no idea who you want to become. And so um, it, we see this everywhere in culture. And I and that's that to me is uh, the philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche used to say, when you stare into the abyss, the abyss also stares back into you. Yeah. And to me, that's what so much of this kind of pornographied culture is doing is that it's actually staring back into us to say, who are we? Um, yeah. The very reality that we're watching billions of hours of porn and wasting so much time really reveals something about our cultural situation that I don't think that many of us have quite articulated. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, and I feel like so much of it has to do with, especially for us men, I, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but it feels to me like so much of it is our, our, our identity as men is received from our fathers. And if we look at our culture, there's so much, uh, there's such been such a breakdown of fatherhood, you know, and you go to, I've seen billboards by the side mm -hmm. of the road, take time to be a father today, you know, like the government literally has to, it's fatherhood.gov, you know, they've, they've got all these initiatives to encourage men to be fathers because it's just this tremendous breakdown of fatherhood, and it, you know there's all these social consequences for that. But but one of the mm -hmm. consequences is we have a bunch of men who've never received any concrete identity from their fathers, and they're and 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 there's always this question in the back of my mind, like who am I? What does it mean to be a man? How do I live that? And mm. they don't know, and so and there's so you just become uh, kind of uh, like you're saying just open to whatever the culture is telling you, the media, uh, pornography, whatever. I mean, when you have companies like Pornhub advertising in Times Square, and this is just normal, mm -hmm. this is just what men do, uh, yeah. wow, yeah, how vulnerable are you to this? Um, and, yes. and and also, too, just um, just this sense of, of uh, like you said, aimlessness in your free time. Like, okay, I do my work my forty hours a week. When I'm off, uh, like, what do I do now? <laughs> and and, yes. and yeah. uh, it's it's a it's a vacuum that's just waiting to be filled. So, well, just one last question, and I, I guess maybe I kind of talked about it a little bit already. But um, why, based on your research, you did interview men and you did interview women. Um, I know. Pornography among women is a growing problem, which is really mm -hmm. shocking in a lot of ways. But for the most part, it's still a majority of men that are looking at pornography today. What is it about us as men that mm -hmm. are so, like you say, seduced by pornographic images that just, you know, creates that cocktail that... that uh, yeah, makes pornography so attractive. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think a, a couple things. I, I can't remember the, the parts per million of testosterone that, uh, I, I forget what the measurement is, but basically when we are like 12, 13 mm -hmm. years old, we have like 200, whatever this measurement is of testosterone. And then by the time we get to 15, that goes up to about 1,200. So, I mean, the equivalent of like this much testosterone in our system going up to like a pint glass full um, it is astronomical. So part of what, you know, we have to name is that there, there is something about basic human arousal that we haven't articulated much that a lot of times the church has been largely silent on preparing men to be in their bodies that, you know, when you start going through puberty, you're going to begin to sexualize anything and everything. Um, and so if we don't have language to talk about that and we don't have some language to normalize and prepare men for their bodies, that is going to be experienced as a lot of shame. And what we know about the addiction cycle is that the more shame that you feel, the more that you're actually going to pursue more unwanted sexual behavior. So if I feel unwanted, if I feel like I'm going through a lot of bullying, I feel like I'm experiencing a lot of heartache, one of the reasons why I will pursue pornography is not just escape, but it actually reinforces those original feelings of judgment. And so I would say that one of the reasons is that we haven't really created uh, really good sex education for men. Um, but I think the much larger issue is when we look at Genesis 3 of what the curse for a man is, it, essentially the curse for a man is that your life is going to be full of thorns and thistles. There is going to be a blog uh, that has more Catholic readership than the Catholic gentleman. There's going to be a better book than Unwanted written. Um, there, there's going to be a business that makes more money. And so essentially what happens is that we feel that curse, that every single thing that we do has thorns and thistles by the sweat of our brow, by, you know, basically blood is how we're going to get through life. And so if that's a man's experience of I'm lonely, I'm being surpassed for a promotion at work, one that I really deserved, uh, I feel like I really have tried to do really good with intimacy with my spouse, but she seems to be kind of on another planet. Like, what do I do with all of that disappointment? Yeah. And I would say that that's the seduction of pornography is that it basically creates a world without thorns and thistles for us. Yeah. That. We can get nine minutes is what Pornhub says is the average male user in the U.S., like nine minutes uh, to look at porn, to get what I want, and then to basically reset for the whole day. And so I think that that's part of what we have to engage, especially as adults, is to say, what am I doing with my futility? What am I doing with this sense of ache, this loneliness? And if I'm not pursuing people, if I'm not pursuing purpose, if I'm not pursuing things that actually make my heart and my body come alive, pornography is going to be the inevitable outcome yeah. of an unlived life. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it really is that, um, you know, it's so prevalent in our culture. It's so easy to access, you know, that, it is inevitable, like you say, unless we are filling that void with something. You know, a, a, a psychologist I was reading the other day was was saying that that basically all temptations to sexual sin are a desire to fill my emotional emptiness now, fast, quick fix. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've got this pain, this ache in me. Fix it. And the mm -hmm. fastest way to do that is to lose myself in this kind of parallel reality where I can mm -hmm. get whatever I want, whatever I want. And, and it's, a, it, it's a tremendously uh, challenging thing. So I guess um, I, I'm, of course, going to refer people to your book, um, Available Everywhere. Books are sold, as the saying goes. <laughs> um, but, yeah. you know, I got my copy on Amazon, of course. But... Um, so, yeah. you know, looking at this whole two-part book and uh, tons of research that went into this and all these findings and statistics, what's the one takeaway that you would leave people with? You know, the one message to someone who's watching this uh, mm -hmm. who's, who's struggling, maybe they feel like they're completely without hope, there's no way I can overcome this pattern in my life. Um, I've prayed, mm -hmm. I've, you know, 
gone to con confession a million times. I just feel like I'm totally defeated. It's ruining my life, ruining my relationship with God. What would you tell someone like that? I would say that your sexual brokenness can be a roadmap to healing, not a life sentence to sexual sin. Um, and that's, I mean, that's why I wrote this book. I also have a, uh, online course that's called the heart of man journey, and that can be found at heartofmanjourney.com. And basically what I did in the, there's a film called the heart of man. Uh, we wanted to equip the church and individuals and accountability partners for this journey out of this, because so much of what you just described of what that man saying, I, I go to confession, I've tried, uh, what I would say is that our unwanted sexual behavior, our pornography use, our infidelity pursuit, uh, those are not random at all. And if they're not random, then that means that the road to freedom is not random either. And so that's what we did uh, within this kind of 18 episode course is to really help people identify what was my family, uh, what were some of the significant experiences that I went through in childhood, like trauma, bullying, uh, and then what was I dealing with in the present? How much lack of a purpose did I have? How much depression or anxiety? Because if we don't transform those themes in our life, the pursuit of pornography is inevitable. So this course, and I would say the book, are really this invitation to uh, be curious about the things that you're struggling with. And instead of just trying to pray them away, this radical shift of saying, what if embedded in your sexual brokenness are actually clues to the freedom that you seek? Um, and that's what all of the research and this course and the book are really designed to do is to help you identify and transform your life so that you can actually pursue the freedom that you desire. And that's not a random journey. Um, it can happen. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, I love your I love your yeah. tagline. Listen to your lust. I mean, there, there yeah. it's really saying something, and mm -hmm. listening to that can can offer us uh, the road to freedom. So, check out the book Unwanted. Uh, you can find it uh, on on Amazon or in a lot of uh, bookstores. Um, it, it really is a powerful book. So if you're watching this, don't wait. Go get a copy. And then um, could you just repeat the Heart of Man course again? Yep. It's uh, heartofmanjourney.com. Uh, and my website is jay-stringer.com. And then you can click on a tab that says online course, and it will take you there as well. Um, so jay-stringer.com. So Thanks so That's much true. for being with us, Jay. It's been an awesome conversation. I'm thinking of all these other things that we could talk about, but I want to be respectful of your time. But thanks so much for, for being with us. Yeah, we, we can do this again. So enjoyed it, Sam. Thank you so much for having me on. I very much appreciate it. God bless.